you know, if you show up every day with your game plan, like, like you did with your charts, and I always think that you always have to come in with some sort of a story or a theme as to, hey, if this happens, I'm bearish, or if this happens, I'm bullish, or if this happens, I'm doing nothing. Because other than that, you come in as a rudderless ship and you're chasing price action as opposed to anticipating uh, versus reacting to price action. And I think that's what a lot of traders don't do is they just kind of come in and like, okay, we're going to see what happens today. And I'm like, I oh, know you really can't do that. You got to have a game plan. What do you mean by a story? Give me an example. Well, the easiest one is the, the story, the story that I'm using right now, we're trapped in a hundred point S and P range yep. of, you know, 4070 to 4170. And we're just having these monster moves intraday. Um, so for me, I've got key, like you were talking about, I've got key support levels and resistance levels that if those are broken, that's my story. My story is if we break that, hold it, try to retest it, I'm bearish. If we break up, hold it, retest it, and, you know, rally from there, I'm bullish. It's a simple, you know, for me, it's as simple as that. Um, that's what I come in and I know what I want to do if certain things happen, because if I don't come in with that, I'm not really, you know, I'm kind of reacting to the market. Um, you know, I am leaning bearish right now, but fact is we're in a trading range. So I hold on to that loosely, but that's my overall feeling. And if we do get below, let's say 4090, 4070, then my conviction level goes up. I think what a lot of people don't understand, I think if you have a story I think it anchors you and gives you something you can kind of lean on, which increases your conviction. Because if you don't have any conviction that the choppiness and the, the skittishness of the price action can easily shake you out of these positions. Um, and I think that's a really important part. And that, that's kind of the art that you develop over years or from your experience. And art's maybe not the right word, but feel, intuitiveness. One thing that's incredible to me is that the exchange has not reduced the tick size for the futures over time, like especially yeah. NASDAQ futures. I mean, NASDAQ futures are still trading in quarter ticks, you know, and the yep. interesting thing is, is that like this was like 2002. This is during the bear market. The NASDAQ, the NDX was below a thousand. So it was trading 900 something. And back then the NASDAQ traded in half ticks. Then they changed it to quarter ticks, and it's been quarter ticks ever since. And it's it's a ludicrously small tick size, which means, like you said, you have these algorithms like whipping them all over the place, like all this high frequency stuff. Like it's a nightmare to trade. It is. But, you know, what's funny is that when one of the reasons I transitioned away from stocks way back when was, we, you know, when I got into the business, eighth and quarter point spreads were the norm. Um you know, and you were dealing with the specialist in New York, even though it was electronically, you're still dealing with the human being. So there was a, the ability to read that person's character, how they kept their book and kind of glean insights from that. But then when they started to go down to 16ths and then down to pennies, it was like, holy crap. It was it made the game so much harder because of the algorithms were coming in then. And it's just, you know, you'd get as, the, as we used to call it, you get penny to death. You could never sustain a move. It was just all this back and forth chop. Yeah, and the small tick size reduces incentives to display liquidity, right? If the tick size is an eighth in stocks, then as a market maker, you're incentivized to post bids and offers because you can make an eighth. You know, if you're just making yep. a penny, then everybody steps in front of each other and it's terrible. Exactly. Dec decimalization has not been a good thing. It hasn't. I, I completely agree. It's what it, it's what sidelined me and sidelined what we had as our prop group at the time. It just phased out, phased out. The volatility just shrunk. Now, granted, the market structure changed, the market dynamics changed. I get that that happens, but it wasn't good for us. Not not at all. We phased out our operations in 02. When I was doing Index Arb, uh, so I was trading the futures in Chicago, and I, I had a program trading terminal where I would trade the Nasdaq stocks. And we would mm -hmm. route them to usually spear leads at night, you know, wholesalers. Mm -hmm. We would route these these stocks to wholesalers. And this is back when we still had fractions. They would auto X us on 2,000 shares for every name in the index for free. And when we went to decimalization in 2002, they were out of business in two months. Like it just disappeared.
You know, it's funny how far we've come. When I first started prop trading, I was trading with a group called Bright Trading, started by a guy by the name of Bob Bright and Eddie Franco, two former card counters in Vegas. Uh, in fact, they used, they, I think they even teamed up with Blair Hall at one point in time. He was part of their, part of their gang, so to speak. Super cool guys to work with because they understood probabilities, which of course is what this game boils down to. But I remember Bob Bright telling me that when he first started trading S&P futures, he'd armed them by walking across the street to the other exchange. It was still that <laughs> antiquated, not antiquated, but it was still set up like that way back when. And he was a math guy. He was, I think he was a PhD in math or at least a master's in math. So he understood that stuff. And he had this other funny story, too, when um, he still lives in Vegas to this day. I, I, I believe he's still alive. He, he was older when I first met him. Um, he, both he and Eddie could not go to the casinos. They were barred. But when the Riverboat Casino started opening up down in Louisiana, they didn't know who the hell he was. So he says, I'm going on vacation next week. I said, where are you heading to, Bob? He goes, I'm going to go terrorize the uh, Riverboat Casinos down in Louisiana. And I think he went down there for about three weeks and took him, took him to the cleaners before they finally figured out, oh, shit, this is Bob Bright. Get him out of here. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of experience, you know, coming into the game was, was instrumental for me uh, because these guys were very calculated. They'd sit at the tables and lose, lose, lose. But once, once the edge came, once the count became in their favor, all in. And that's kind of what you got to do as traders too. You 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 got to make the money when the when the bell's ringing. And sometimes you just got to sit on your hands, which is a lot of the time. Well, that's actually that's the thing I was going to talk about next. So I mentioned that in 2007 I made eight million trade in spoos. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I got better is because I finally figured out that I didn't have to trade every day. Up until that point, I was trading every day and. Eight or nine days out of 10, I was losing money, not a lot of money, but I would lose a small amount of money. Then I would have one big mm -hmm. day. So then I thought to myself, well, what if I just didn't trade on those days where I'm losing money and I just wait for an opportunity and get really big? And so the money that I made in 2007 was pretty much like 20 trading days. And the rest of the year, I didn't trade at all, hardly. It's, that's the reality of the business. Somebody, I don't know who coined the phrase, but you make 80% of your money 20% of the time. Um, I usually find myself making at least one or two trades a day, but I do agree with your premise that the really good trades where you get the, you know, the 3R, the 4R type scenarios, they're not there every day. And if you wait patiently, and the problem that most people have is that they, they, they work themselves into a frenzy, and then when the market finally does break, they're so emotionally beaten down and exhausted that, one, they don't see it, or if they do see it, they're like, oh, I'm probably just going to get my hand slapped yeah. again, and then that's the move. Yep. And I've always described it as, I think there's this, when people come into trading from you know, another, another profession, there's two major problems that they have. One is... If they've been successful in the other profession, they automatically assume they're just going to transition into this. They forget that it took them years to become a good lawyer, a good dentist, a good firefighter, whatever it is. And then number two, and this is the thing I think most people don't think about, is that unlike every other business, you, could, you can put in your eight hours, but you're not going to collect an hourly wage. You might work a week and not make any money. Um, and I don't. I think people have got that forty-hour work week mentality that if you're not making money each week, you're somehow doing something wrong. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. This is a very, <laughs> it's a very twisted industry on some level because it, it, it fucks with your head. Now you said you only focus on a few things. You focus on spoos and bonds or tens, like tens or bonds or and tens and FX. But what currency pairs in FX? Uh, just a couple euro. Aussie dollar, Kiwi dollar, CAD yen on occasion. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm fairly smart, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the ability to do much more than yeah, that. Yeah, but I, I mean, that's but, like that's that's your philosophy. Like, you just concentrate on a couple of things. You don't need to trade yeah. two hundred different stocks. And I don't know if anybody can. I've never met anybody who's been in this industry a long time that really comes at it from that standpoint. And, you know, you probably know a lot of people, uh, you know, in some some really good traders, really good people in finance. 
I've never known them to be of that of that mindset. They're specialists, like just like in every other field. Um, but that's what that's that's my that's my belief, um, because I think if you do focus in on a handful, it sounds so weird, but the price action begins to speak to you after a while because you're watching it day in and day out. You don't have that luxury if you're doing scans every night. And that seems to be another big myth in the industry. Oh, if I run a scan and find all these stocks that are about to do X, Y, and Z, I don't know, sounds like a lot of work for not a lot of reward. And I don't think it works. 